Hey, everybody, welcome to Attack of the Show. On the old program today, Academy Award winning director Ron Howard is here. Yeah. We're going to talk about the latest arrested development news and Project Imagination, the user generated photo contest that will inspire his next movie. Wow. Plus, the Iceman cometh with punches, probably. <laughs> UFC legend Chuck Liddell joins Blair Butler and Blair Hunter to break down not one, but two title fights at UFC 136. You can find out who Chuck thinks will win the belt. And then you can argue with him, and he'll punch you to death. Seriously, he'll murder you. And we'll discuss the legacy of Steve Jobs with Chris Hardwick and Techzilla host Veronica Belmont. Huge All show. All this and more on today's attack. Oh, yes, hello, everybody. It is Attack of the Show. I'm Kevin Ferreira. It's good to see you. And I'm Candace Bailey. We are coming to you live from the G4 Studios in Los Angeles. Yesterday, while we were live on air, we found out that Apple co-founder Steve Jobs had passed away at the age of 56. Yeah, we're going to be spending some time today remembering Steve and the massive impact that he had on the technology that most all of us use every single day. Every day. First off, today's web videos are our favorite Steve Jobs moments. Yeah, so here's a top five tribute to the man himself. At a keynote address in 1983, Steve Jobs promised to change the way we all thought about personal computing with the launch of the Apple Macintosh. And he did so with a George Orwell-inspired commercial directed by Ridley Scott. And thus, it also changed the way we all thought about advertising. Was George Orwell right about 1984? like that. I right? think it was. I mean, this is at a time when computing was either IBM or a clone. I mean, that's yeah, all it was. And that's what they were calling out. Like, all right, you do have a choice. We're not going to just have one option in the computing world. And that ad, they actually only aired once. It was during the Super Bowl. And mm -hmm. yet, I think it was estimated that like $24 million worth of free advertising revenue uh, was had because everybody was discussing this commercial. They were playing it on the nightly news, on yeah. every TV show. They were discussing it because ads didn't look like that back yeah. in 1984. So clearly ahead of his time, not just with the product, but with the advertising with campaign as well. And he was directly involved with it. Now, from that, uh, from that first 1984 ad, Apple has always tried to position its products as being a better alternative to the PC market. Yeah, in the late 80s, one of the largest PC manufacturers, IBM, used the slogan, Think. So Apple went with Think Different. And here's an unaired <laughs> version of a commercial from that famous campaign that was uh, actually narrated by Mr. Jobs himself.
love that yeah. ad. It's so inspirational. It's so amazing. Fun fact, uh, Richard Dreyfuss actually did the VO for that, but that was Steve Jobs' voice, and it's even cooler with him and much more meaningful. Yeah, I, you know, I just got, I just got a bit of chills because I realized you could recut that commercial today and put in footage of Steve Jobs mm -hmm. in black and white, and I don't think anybody would, would no. take exception no. to him being Absolutely included not. with those people, and that, to me, is the ultimate testament of his legacy. Love that. Yeah. Jobs was able to differ differentiate Macs from PCs by offering consumers a safe and some would, I think, agree, a user-friendly experience. This philosophy was punctuated by the wildly successful Mac versus PC ad campaign that ran for years, featuring the very funny John Hodgman and Justin Long. Hello, I'm a Mac. And I'm a PC. Action! 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 Zoom tight, you okay? No, I'm not okay. I have that virus that's going around. Oh, yeah. In fact, you better, you better stay back. This one's a doozy. That's okay. I'll be fine. No, no. Do not be a hero. Last year, there were 114,000 known viruses for PCs. PCs? Not Max. So, you just grab this one. I think I got to crash. Hey, if you feel like that'll help, good. like a big, I was a big Unix guy for a long time, and then I was a staunch Windows guy, very anti-Apple, anti-Mac. Really? And then around the time, yeah, and just a little bit before that ad campaign really started, I had kind of started migrating my own personal use to Macs, and as much as I hated being compared to Justin Long, um, <laughs> I had to give it to him. It was an incredible ad campaign that oh, had yeah. spawned countless imitators. Yeah, and like T-Mobile. T-Mobile T -Mobile is still using them. it to this day, yeah. but I mean, now you see lots of people standing in front of all white talking about their product. They were really the first to do that and do yeah. it in mass, so. And they did it great. Yeah, absolutely. Steve Jobs was one of the most successful college dropouts since John Belushi left Faber College and became a U.S. Senator. <laughs> Google it. All right. Well, Jobs wandered Silicon Valley after leaving college and counted those experiences as some of the most formative of his life. So in 2005, he offered some life advice to the graduates at Stanford University during a commencement address. Sometimes life's going to hit you in the head with a brick. Don't lose faith. I'm convinced that the only thing that kept me going was that I loved what I did. You've got to find what you love, and that is as true for work as it is for your lovers. Your work is going to fill a large part of your life, and the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking and don't settle. As with all matters of the heart, you'll know when you find it. And like any great relationship, it just gets better and better as the years roll on. So keep looking. Don't settle. Yeah! More wise words. I wish I had had him at my graduation. I don't even remember who I had. Precisely. <laughs> I mean, most But if most I had had Steve Jobs, yeah. that would have been awesome. And it's it, like, it, it's so true that he clearly loved what he did because when he was ousted from Apple, actually, by the board of directors the yeah. first time, he didn't stop. He could have. He would have been rich a thousand times over for the rest of his life, but he invested every penny he had back into Next and, and back into Pixar at the time because he loved this stuff and he just couldn't ignore that fact. And that is I so telling. That. Those weren't just empty words. Uh, Steve Jobs was known really as a master presenter. His keynotes at Apple events were highly anticipated by Apple fans and by tech junkies everywhere. But nothing can outdo the unveiling of the first iPhone on January 9, 2007. No one in the audience knew what they were going to do or see that morning, but when Jobs started putting it all together for them, the crowd went wild. Three things. A widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. An iPod. A phone and an internet communicator. An iPod, a phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. Uh, in, case, uh, in case you don't know how that turned out for them, uh, they did. <laughs> they did.
you know, I don't, I don't have an iPhone still, which I can now because it's going to be on Sprint. But um, <laughs> odds are, any phone that any of us in this room and you guys at home have today are because of the iPhone and because of Steve Jobs. Yeah, I mean, since the iPhone, a lot of design cues have been taken from there. The concept of the App Store is something that you, you can't. It's not optional anymore. You have to have it. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was a magical window of time when the first iPhone came out that I think the the. The most brilliant part about the device is that if you were a nerd and you threw that down on the countertop, like within the first three or four weeks of release, you were getting laid <laughs> because the device was oh, so. Oh, you got laid? But I, no, 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 no. I didn't because I didn't oh. have one until like the fourth week. But for everybody else out there, it was one of those devices that, even outside of the nerd circle, there was so much hype and anticipation for it. You threw it down, and it was a conversation piece. Yeah. What is this foreign alien Absolutely. piece of technology? And even still. Like uh, years after the first release, I'd be brushing my teeth and be streaming a YouTube video on this tiny little communicator device on my countertop that has more memory and more power and more capability than my first four computers combined. <laughs> it still blows my mind to this day. Yeah. And I'll probably get the 4S as well. So um, <laughs> thank sure you. I mean, I, I said it yesterday. Uh, I, I truly believe it. I think Steve Jobs is an artist and his medium was technology. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, these are just five of our favorite Steve Jobs videos. Yes, there are literally hundreds of others out there that show how Steve and Apple have influenced today's culture. So please explore on YouTube or elsewhere if you get the chance because Steve Jobs was just a true inspiration to mm -hmm. all of us. And still ahead, we'll actually be joined by special guests Chris Hardwick yeah! and Veronica Belmont. We're going to have a little discussion of the life and the legacy of Steve Jobs. So stick around. Dying broke yesterday. The Twitterverse exploded with thoughts on his passing. 24 hours later, you guys are still talking. So I'm going to check in with you. All right, Ocular Nervosa. The Apple computer revolutionized Super Bowl commercials too. After that, every company competed to put their best on. Yeah, we were just talking about that. Darian, dude, uh, whether or not you're a fan of Apple products, you can't argue the fact that Steve had created a true vision of the future technology. You're absolutely right. I mean, Star Trek, the pad. Um, Exploited Soul, Steve was awesome. His tools never seemed like tools, but more like toys of the imagination. Here's to the Swiss Army knife of technology. Yeah. You couldn't have said it better. Thank you guys for your tweets. Now over to Kevin. I, I can't say it better either. Good night, everybody. No, it's true. When you carry around a, a piece of someone's dream in your pocket every single day, it's hard to not be personally affected by their passing. And joining me now is Chris Hardwick, everybody. The old hey nerdist is here. Hello. And by a satellite co-host of Techzilla, Miss Veronica Belmont joins hey, us as well. Hey, Veronica Belmont. All right, so Chris, uh, I want to ask you, because uh, obviously sure. not just the tech world is mourning here. Everybody is. Uh, on every news channel, they're uh, airing documentaries and lookbacks, and, and, and social media has been flooded with remembrances. And the, the most interesting thing, I think, are people actually flocking to the brick-and-mortar stores, people showing up to physical Apple stores right. to put down flowers and to light candles. When was the last time, if you can remember, that a CEO has had this impact, like this kind of impact? I don't know. If anyone ever passed away at Sun Microsystems, no one ever went down there right. to bring them cake. Right. You know, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, but, but when you think about Steve Jobs and you see him, you know, in the, in the videos we saw on the, on the ATN today, it was just seeing him, what a compelling speaker he was. And, and he, you really believed the passion and the vision that he had. And he really gave us this idea of the future that we all had. We all had this sort of, you know, Star Trek-y, uh, Kubrickian idea of what future technology would look like. Mm -hmm. And he gave that to us uh, and influenced so many different areas that, you know, that most people don't even think about. I mean, like ancillary businesses, like like podcasting, which is very important to me. Right. The whole And for Veronica knows this. She's been podcasting since you could podcast. But it didn't really tip for podcasting until iTunes made the delivery service, you know, uh, easy. Yeah, it's funny. But Veronica, it, there was a time on the internet where broadcasting uh, was explained in long-winded sentences that involved multiple applications and someone at the end scratching their head going, so what dial is it on the radio? Um, and then Apple made it one click away. Is that, I mean, is that a testament to what Steve does best? Is figuring out how to make things accessible? Yeah, it's funny thinking back to that time because we were all thinking we were going to get sued out of existence for just calling ourselves podcasters because of the iPod. And uh, it definitely blew that medium out of the water once they added it to iTunes and we were able to reach that huge audience. 
You know, he, uh, Steve, everybody says, was he was a fun guy. He encouraged people to be weird. Uh, you know, he, he made being a nerd cool. I mean, he was the guy that encouraged pirate flags to be hung even at Apple headquarters as divisions competed. Um, uh, do, you th do you think, Veronica, that when he left the company and came back, was it a different Steve Jobs, or was this the Steve Jobs that we, that we would have seen him naturally grow into over the years? I think that him leaving the company and coming back made him a different person. He came back in a more experienced person. He had a, a vision of who he really wanted to be and what he wanted the company to turn into, and he followed through with that. And Chris, when he left uh, one of the companies that he invested in heavily and then ac actually put his founder title on, which I think is, is totally due, uh, was Pixar. Mm -hmm. and, and people focus on him as a technology guy and this technology leader, but in the movie industry, he revolutionized that as well. Well, and I, and I, but I think what you said in the first block of the show, and this also proves that I do watch this show. Oh, thank you. Uh, when that, you're on set. <laughs> that you said he's an artist and his medium was technology, and yeah. he, really, he really was. I mean, when you look at every aspect of the hardware design and the software design and the, and the way that, that all of the, 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 the hardware where it interacts with, with one another. I mean, he really built this beautiful artistic te technological ecosystem. And I think even, even PC people who, like, and I want to make one thing clear, and I've said this on the show before, but when people say, like, oh, you, uh, you and Pereira are just all over Steve Jobs' jock, and it's like, yeah. listen, Apple doesn't give us anything. They've never given us anything. We're going to have to buy the iPhone to review it next week. Right. So we get Apple nothing. taken away from me. Exactly. Actually. They've come to They've my taken house, a lot broken of our to money. my door, and taken it. Yeah, and so, you know, we do this willingly because we love, we love these products. And we like simple UIs, and we like mm -hmm. we like lines that are clean. And we always say, you know, there's a very and I'm sorry for offending PC nerds. There's a very PC approach to things, which is very very engineer oriented, I think. And there's a very artistic approach to things, and I think that's what Apple is. I think that's their aesthetic. Yeah, Veronica. Yeah, and to add to that, please. for example, when you played that. Um that iPhone announcement from 2009. Have you ever heard journalists clap for something like that? <laughs> right. like, that doesn't happen. Right. That only has ever happened at Apple events that I've seen. And that was really the first time that journalists saw a device like that that just blew their minds. There was always this sense of, uh, okay, what is that one more thing? What is that whimsy going to be? And, and Veronica, can you think of another company that competes with Apple on that level of, of potential astonishment where people are on the edge of their seats waiting for that announcement? I don't think so. I mean, a lot of companies have tried, and that's one of the, the things that Apple has changed in the technology industry is that every single piece of consumer electronics that we put our hands on these days is in some way influenced by Apple, in some way influenced by Steve's vision. And that's just going to continue in the next years. Yeah. When Steve was uh, working at Next, uh, which was basically going to compete with Apple, he developed a new operating system, and he learned that I mean, look, he didn't have much to announce with his operating system, but right. he learned then the power of secrecy. Mm -hmm. By not revealing too much, he could build hype and people would be interested in that. Do you think that carried over to his personal life as well? Because not much is really known about Steve's personal life. I know almost nothing about him right. other than, than what he's done in his work. And maybe his life was his work. I was even wondering last time, like, does he have kids? Like, I don't even know. Yeah. He might. Yeah. He does. Uh, he okay, does. good. He does. Did you, good. But, but you actually got to meet him, which is something I, that I uh, did, I did, most well, of us have not. You know, to say meet is really a bad... I, I, to be uh, in his vicinity I was is in his worth vicinity. an achievement. You unlocked it. Uh, G4 gave me the opportunity to go to many keynotes. Uh, I was a uh, third row jobs last year, uh, which was really <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and uh, so I've been, to, I've been to many, and I got to see him up close, and I could see. And so, like, I remember I went to the iPad announcement, and a bunch of us came out afterwards, and I saw guys from Gizmodo, you know, like at the time, like Jason Chen, or I saw, I saw, uh, I saw uh, Ryan Block, uh, for instance, and like we saw each other, and after the iPad announcement, we're like. This guy's lost it. Who is going to buy this device? How, how dare you, Steve Jobs? <laughs> then you get your hands on it, and you're like... Then you touch it, and you melt into I'm a sorry, four-year-old. I'm sorry to take it here, but, it, but, but the iPad is almost like masturbating for the first time. You're like, it can do that! <laughs> like, when you get your hands on it. Uh, and so... So I saw Steve Jobs after, I think it was after the iPad announcement, he was just sort of wandering through the demonstration area, and I saw him coming, I'm like, oh my god, here he comes, I gotta say something. And uh, my big thing, just, this was such a fail on my part, all I could think to say was, because you never say anything impressive to famous people when right. you meet them, he, was, he came like, he got this close to me, and I was just like, this was after the keynote, and I was like, um, pretty good job up there. Like, that's what I said to Steve Jobs, <laughs> pretty good job up there. And he, he just kind of went... Thanks. And kept walking. I was wow. like, damn it. Yeah. Like Chris Farley. Like, what are miss. you doing? Swing and a miss. Yeah, swing and a miss. <laughs> right. But at, at least was, you got a chance to, to swing at but it. But he really just had this wonderful air about him, just sort of floating through right. uh, the demo area. Veronica, real quick, you know, going forward now, do you think people will look at Apple differently as, as a company because of Steve's absence? 
It will be hard not to, but, you know, Steve was a visionary, and I'm sure that Apple has their plans laid out for years to come. So in terms of the company, I'm not worried, but in terms of the rabid fan base, maybe that will start to be on the decline a little bit. Yeah, I, mean, I, I had a dream last night that he actually became Lawnmower Man, and, like, all of our iPhones oh, rang at they once. They started lighting up at the same <laughs> time. He was, he was there, because I think I really, really did. Yeah. Uh, and I really think there was something beautiful about when people were asking me for quotes on this, and I realized that I was eulogizing him on one of his devices. Right. And I kind of I was like, this is a nice moment. That's true. Well, it's his, the way he would want it. Absolutely. Yeah. His, his visions have touched us, and I'm sure they will for ages. They've inspired uh, an entire uh, evolution, if not a revolution in technology, and he'll, he'll, he'll deeply be missed by all of us. Um, thank you, Chris Hardwick. Thank, thank you, Veronica. Veronica. Thanks, Veronica. From TechZilla for joining us. I uh, really appreciate the time. Of course. And now, we'll throw it over to Miss Candace Bailey. We asked our viewers to send in their reactions to the passing of Steve Jobs, and we were so overwhelmed by responses, we couldn't get to all of them. Here are just a few. He was a brilliant man, a genius, a visionary. You know, he's definitely made huge dents in the universe. He didn't only really see the future, he helped design the future. His products were truly awe-inspiring. His products brought me joy and entertainment since I could first use a computer. These are just some of my Apple products. I got some more scattered around the house. I live on my iTouch. My first experience with Apple was like so many people. I was in grade school uh, playing Oregon Trail on those big five inch floppy disks. We just got our new computer lab with some Apple IIs and I spent far too much time there making bleeps and bloops. I was always just the fat, nerdy girl, and once I discovered that, you know, I was good at computers and I loved computers, that just, that was unbelievable for me. He's changed the world and he's changed my life. My favorite Apple product, apart from the iPhone, which I'm recording this on, has to be the iPad. My seven-year-old nephew has one, and uh, he has autism, and uses the iPad every day to help him learn and communicate in a way I don't think would have been possible without it. My husband and I downloaded several applications. Uh, a calendar was used to help us conceive our now five-month-old son. Someday we'll be handing it to him in a restaurant and getting him to play Angry Birds, so he'll be quiet for five minutes. Without him, the world would be a little less brighter and a little less connected. He was a great man and he will be greatly missed. He will be missed. He will thoroughly be missed, but you will never be forgotten. Things will never be the same without him. Thanks, Steve. just ask the question out loud, but Kevin talked to Ron Howard himself. Please welcome to the show Academy Award winning producer and director, Ron Howard, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the show, sir. Pleasure. I hope we, uh, well, thank you. Uh, I, was, I was told not to make direct eye contact or touch you, but you, yeah, you, you, you initiated no, that's the that, contact. You know, that's, that's, that's those people and the, and the barriers they try to create. This is, a, uh, well, this is your first attack appearance, is it not? It, it is. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here. We should. And this set, you know, this set is even, it's even cooler in person yeah. than it yeah. manages to be. We should christen you. We should strike you with a bottle of champagne. Oh. This is a <laughs> well, it's an attack. Occasion. You're, you're, attack. Yes. And you're joining the illustrious ranks of of, uh, the Insane Clown Posse uh, uh, right. uh, and Steve-O. So if at any point in this interview you want to staple your testicles to your thigh, you uh, let me know. Okay, all right. We'll, well, we'll get it to happen. We have a huge art department. Let's see how the first one goes. <laughs> If, this, if we click in this episode, t testicle stapling is not entirely out of there. It could right. happen. It could that's, possibly that's happen all I need is later a, on down the it road. It could happen. Okay. Um, let's talk about things that are actually happening, because you have your hands on so many different projects. One right now is Project Imagination. Right. Okay. Uh, and I even have the hat for it. I see that. Uh, uh, <laughs> but, uh, well, th this is something that the people from Canon came to me about. Mm -hmm. I've never done any sort of you know, connection with a, uh, uh, an, an agency or anything like that before, but they had this idea for a thing called Project Imagination they wanted to do, which was really, really cool. It's an experiment. Basically, they wanted to take eight different categories of, of storytelling, you know, mm -hmm. narrative storytelling, what I do, and they, and they wanted to offer the opportunity 
to you know photographers all over the country to enter photographs um, that to them reflected one of those categories, whether it was mood or you know, like setting, setting, character, right, relationships, time, yeah. um, and the unknown, all these really important storytelling elements, goal, and um, and they did. They got and 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 the idea was to then with the, narrow it down, uh, have a winner, and then fashion a short film out of taking inspiration from those from those eight you know those eight images. I thought it was a fantastic creative idea and really cheap storyboarding. Uh, As a well, producer, that, that's right. It's done. I mean, it, it, you just it, kill that one off the spreadsheet. So I, I could, I, I knew I could, didn't have time to direct it. I was really excited about it creatively. Um, and I thought it would work in an interesting way, but it was also a little scary. And then they said, "Well, you could mentor somebody." And uh, and for, I'm guilty that I didn't. You think chose of an it. inner city youth. Didn't I you? did. <laughs> My daughter, Bryce oh, Dallas Howard. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, and 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 she's done some directing, directed theater, and um, you know, and she wanted to do it. And we're and and we're, so we're having a great a great time collaborating. That must have been fun. Is this is this your first time collaborating other than conception? Uh, the. Uh, <laughs> No, well, like, in, in fact, no. Uh, the uh, she she actually produced a movie that Gus Van Sant directed called Restless, yeah. and she's working on a screenplay also. And 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 uh, you know, so she's so I, I've been working with her for a while. She keeps wondering when I'm going to cast her in a movie. Now that she's directing, I'm wondering when the hell she's going to cast me. Yeah. Uh, Soon. Uh, yeah, I Soon. hope so. I hope Tell so. you, if we break out that stapler, you got oh, a reel. Oh. You got See, a I, reel. Yeah, I, <laughs> um, so I the the. The subjects are, are varied, and I imagine that because they're so open to interpretation, like something like the unknown, right? The the array of entries that you must have had must have been incredible. It's just a spectrum, right? Well, I mean, I think there were ninety six thousand, uh, you know, entrants, and and then people voted on online. Mm -hmm. That narrowed it down a lot. Canon had a couple of votes. We voted uh, for the sort of within the finalists, and ultimately it narrowed down to ten per category. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I sent in uh, one. I don't. I believe it was in the unknown. It might have been oh, really? a challenge or goal. Oh, really? Um, but oh. and I think. Well, now that's amazing. <laughs> and I'll tell you because it it was night for a little while. It for was... just a little while, uh, that was night. <laughs> oh, and, so close! And then it got kicked so down. Close. It was ten. Did I get and... beat out by a photo of a tree that was shot with HDR? <laughs> I did, didn't I? I think it was something cuter. Oh. <laughs> What are you talking about? Maybe it was, do we need to pull the photo up? No, we don't. Um, I have you here, so I have to ask. There's been a, a lot of confusion online. Some people are confirming um, this project that you were involved with. Uh, I believe it was a TV show called Arrested Development. Well, that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> people have said not only is a movie happening, but there's a seven to nine part series that's going to set up the characters and how they've gotten older, and in, that's going to tee up the movie. In, so if you could just confirm that now for us. You know, in, in all of us who are involved, in our hearts and minds, it is all done. Fantastic. The quote ends there. Thank you so much. <laughs> but, uh, no, Mitch Hurwitz is writing. Uh, the cast is totally behind the idea. And as he was working on the movie, he began to develop the sense that, wow, we need to catch up with these characters, but it'll right. take too much time in the movie. You'll have a four-hour so, IMAX 3D spectacle just to figure out where they are. What if we reintroduced in a very particular way, not really like the old episodes, but in a new way using the characters, but on TV, in, reintroduce the booths and everyone around them, and then let the actual reunion be the movie. And everybody in the cast loves this idea. And mostly it's just he's got, he's got so much funny stuff that right. he just wants to do. So Look, Maybe so, let me ask, who doesn't love the idea? Can you, uh, we get their, <laughs> no, their no, name, no, phone number, a, 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 email look, address? Everybody at every studio and company is very supportive of the idea. <laughs> okay. But okay. there's much to be worked out. There are there are business timing issues and <laughs> scheduling factors. We got to figure out who's got the ringtone rights. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a lot a lot to be scheduled. Is yeah, it look, going the fans to have kept, the fans have kept it have kept it going, uh, and and I think everybody who is involved, their sort of love of having been a part of it and and wanting to experience that again. But uh, you know the fans have been noisy. I'd say keep being noisy. Uh, and uh, uh, and is it gonna? I mean I I really really believe it will. But it's not it's not a green light, and it's not all paid for yet. Finally. So the series starts fall 2012, feature in 2013. <laughs> just, just wink once. Whatever you say. All right, we'll take it. <laughs> Ron, I am an, uh, a huge, huge fan, to say the least. It's an honor to interview you. Anytime, you. you are welcome here, and we got a swing line with your name on it. Oh, it really oh, is. Beautiful. A true pleasure. Ron okay. Howard, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. For more information on Project Imagine.
imagination, go to youtube.com slash imagination. I gotta say, he is amazing. And how about that Ron Howard, huh? Yeah! Were you talking about yourself? Yeah. I'm so sure. Stay tuned, MMA Show called has opinions about this weekend's UFC 136. Find out who will win and who will get hot kicks from Chuck Liddell himself right after this. Fail. You're dead. Major fail. Fail. Fail, 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 fail. You lose. Right. Just so you know, making fun of a highly trained UFC fighter because he's a featherweight, it's a really bad idea. <laughs> right? That was impressive. Was, you're not, he's not impressed with that. Please welcome Blair Butler and UFC Hall of Famer and former light heavyweight champion, Mr. Chuck Liddell. <laughs> so, like... Iceman, Miss, Mr. Iceman, Mr. Ice, Mr. Man. Chuck's fine. Chuck is fine, okay. <laughs> Anything you want, Chuck. Uh, all right, we've got uh, two huge championship title fights to discuss, so let's uh, jump right in. The first one, the featherweight title bout, Jose Aldo. Chuck <laughs> told me how to say that right. Versus Kenny Florian. Uh, tail of tape is Florian's got the height and reach advantage, but Aldo has the youth and speed on his side. Aldo's got uh, quick and explosive hands and a very strong ground game. Florian just dices people up with his elbows, and he's improved his striking and jujitsu skills. Now, Chuck, this is Kenny's third attempt at a title belt. A lot of people are saying he's kind of like the Tony Romo of MMA. He chokes in the big games. Uh, you know, I don't think that's that's the case. I think uh, this this weight class will be a lot better for him. He's, he's moved down from, he's, shoot, he started in 85s, 185s right. on the show, the show with me, but... Um, yeah, I don't think I don't think he's choking. He just he, he got beaten in those fights. Right, and I, it, I wanted to ask you that too. It's interesting that you brought it up. Most times, if people are going up or down a weight a weight class, that actually affects them. And and I know it's something that you, you've seen you've seen people do. Do you think this weight thing is, is it going to help him or hurt him that he's having to kind of change his weight? Well, I think it's gonna it's helping him getting down. He's he's going to be he's big for that weight class. Very big for that weight class. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, and, and it's not the first time he's made it down. It's the second fight down. Which sometimes the first time, first time down there, it's not, not quite, uh, quite easy. But uh, he's a very disciplined guy, and he, he's been working on it for a while. So, uh, so I think he's gonna be fine. It's not gonna bother him. Right. And outside of John Jones, really the deadliest elbows in the game. I mean, those elbows are crazy deadly. Yeah. Yeah, he, he's got some sharp elbows. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And then, and Blair, Aldo's coming off of a, right. that, you know, really that very decisive victory over Hominick. He's taken a lot, of, a, a lot of the best in the game. Yeah. Is this fight going to be a challenge for him? Yeah. And what is he going to have to bring to the table? I think this is actually a big step up in competition. You know, uh, Jose Aldo has amazing striking, great leg kicks. He absolutely destroyed Uriah Faber's legs. Um, the morning after picture of Uriah Faber's leg looked like a, a massacre. It was terrible. But, you know, that being said, if, if Aldo can keep it on his feet, I think this could be really interesting. I don't think we've necessarily seen someone uh, with a crazy reach advantage that's even, you know, trying to take him down repeatedly. Mm -hmm. So that could be something that, that Florian does that maybe changes things up. Okay. Uh, and uh, Chuck, so who do you think takes the fight? Uh, I'm going to go out on the limb with this one. I'm going for Kenny. Oh, know. all right. Yeah. Kenny. I like it. And uh, Ms. Butler, what about you? Uh, I, I, I hate to disagree with Chuck Liddell, but, but I, I am going to give the edge to Jose Aldo, but this is the time for him to prove that he deserves the pound-for-pound pound ranking that he's been given okay. as one of the best in the world. I like how you almost literally just now changed your mind because Chuck said something different than what you wanted to say. I guess I'll just do this. All right, well, let's put down the middle. I like this a lot. This is a good competition here. Uh, next, we've got the lightweight title fight, Frankie Edgar versus Gray Maynard. Part Trey, Trey, yeah. probably say it in French, I think. Uh, looking at the stats, Maynard has the height advantage, but Edgar has the longer reach. Both fighters are, are collegiate wrestlers and will focus on takedowns. Both are also fantastic strikers, although Maynard has better submission skills. But, but Edgar, we've seen some crazy hands. He has really yeah. impressed a lot of people with his hands. Can he finally defeat Maynard and, and take home the title night? Well, here's what's interesting about Frankie Edgar. Every fight he's gone into, he's been the underdog. Right. Uh, I mean, the guy is, he's actually relatively small for 150.
155. Uh, would love to see him fight Jose Aldo at 145 someday. Um, but, you know, he, he's a smaller guy. He's smaller than Gray Maynard. Um, but he has kind of an endless gas tank. The guy has so much energy. So the thing about Frankie Edgar is, you know, along with that great boxing, along with really improved takedown defense, which was his Achilles heel in the first Gray Maynard fight, the guy is just all guts and all go. And I feel like, you know, this could easily go to another decision. Okay. Uh, now, Chuck, Maynard has obviously been in this fight before. What does he have to do to, to bring something different to the table here to make this fight go in a different direction? Uh, I think the thing he has to do is he's got to wear, wear, uh, wear him down a little bit. He's got to get, make him tired, get on top of him a little bit, make him carry his weight. He's a little heavier, he's a little uh, bigger. Um, he just needs to wear on him get, him, get him a little tired, slow him down a little bit, because when he's up there moving as fast as he does and bobbing and moving, He's, uh, he's tough to hit. Right, and I mean, but Maynard's got a, a, a great chin. Is, should he be concerned about Edgar's hands at all? Because he does have fantastic hands, but, you know, should he be concerned about those things? I, I mean, he, he was fine in the last two fights, so right. I'm, not, I'm not too sure he's going to be too worried about that. But, I, I mean, he, I think he needs to get in there and, and lay on him and, and uh, get some weight on him, put, put him up against Cave, take a few more shots. But uh, we'll see. All right, so who do you have in the fight? Uh, I, I think Ray's going to take it this time. All right, Ray's going to take it. I'm a big fan. I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, Oh, yeah. All right, cool. And uh, are you going to have a, what, what Chuck is, said this time? I'm going to tell you that this is the hardest decision I've had to make in 2011 <laughs> on this segment. Um, I always bet against Frankie Edgar, and he always wins. Right. And darn if I'm not going to do it again. I'm going to pick Gray Maynard. <laughs> and I'm going to be wrong again, probably. But I have to go with Gray Maynard. Just a lot of power. All right. Uh, Fran Frankie's a tough guy, man. He, he, he comes back. He's been an underdog, like you said, every time. And, and he, finds, and a way to keep he winning. finds a way to keep winning. And th sometimes that's the best thing. Find a guy that just figures out a way to win. Should have never done that true life. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Uh, so, Chuck, before we go, how can fans get a hold of you? At Chuck Liddell on Twitter. Uh, or uh, chuckledout.com is my uh, website. That's a good Twitter handle. It would be really hard to mess that up. Yeah, right. I know how to find you now. Well, thank you for being here, sir. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Chuck Liddell, everybody. Uh, Blair, as usual, thank you as well. Uh, UFC 136 airs this Saturday on pay-per-view. All right, how about we uh, read some tweets? I mean, we're standing in front of them. Yeah, I we think got that's an here. amazing idea. Might as well. Which one do you want to read? The Real Candace Jake Bailey's. 7000. Oh. Hey, Kay Pereira. Yes. You should step into the ring with Chuck and see how long you last for a real <laughs> epic toga. No! That's an amazing idea. No! I love that idea. No! <laughs> Next tweet! <laughs> Drink Moxie. Uh, Kevin, it takes balls to start off your interview with Academy Award winning director Ron Howard talking about stapling testicles. <laughs> hey! Yes! <laughs> It does take balls to stop talking about. It was one of those moments of like, oh, did I just totally ruin everything? Well, that was the that only was time in my life interview. I'll probably have a chance to ask Ron Howard about stapling his testicles. So you got to go with it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually going to send him a swing line stapler. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Seriously. Uh, coming up, it's epic giveaway time. Oh, yeah, yeah. But first, but first, this Friday marks the 162nd anniversary of Edgar Allan Poe's death, and AOTS has the exclusive trailer for The Raven, which is a serial killer movie inspired by the le legendary writer's works. They only fart like once a century and it's really, really bad. Epictober continues next week on AOTS. Sarah Underwood and I are cowgirling it up to find the marble in the oatmeal. And Sarah Wayne Callies hits the studio with the latest on The Walking Dead. Plus, we hope you like free consoles and collectibles because our insane epic giveaways continue. Then Bustas returns and teams up with Power Girl to save the world from sexy disaster. And Gadgetron takes on the new Samsung Galaxy, a phone so epic they put epic in the name. Epictober continues next week. Who wants free stuff? Me! Me! Oh, you're not eligible. Oh, that's malarkey. Sideshow Collectibles Predator Bust, plus a spectacular survival kit, a prize worth $400. The lucky winner is Logan H. of Redding, California. Congrats to you, and thank you for saving our side shipping. And today, we've got an expert.
Xbox, but not just any Xbox. What? This one is all dressed up, Gears of War 3 Holy style. Hell. Oh, and it freaking glows, y'all. <laughs> to enter, visit our website at g4tv.com slash epic giveaway. Get your entry in between now and Friday, October 7th by 3 p.m. Eastern to be eligible, and we'll announce the winners <laughs> right here on tomorrow's show. <laughs> Nope. Read it. Read it. Read the words. Read the words. Read the words. You gotta read the words, Ken Staley. Busters have no fear. Short turn this Monday. Stick around. We're gonna make a G4 special report on Steve Jobs. It's gonna start right now, but first. Uh, in tribute to the man himself, there's one more thing. Which will air in a couple oh. seconds. Okay. I mean, I like, but one more thing, thing isn't what's just dead air. Happen? We actually have something that's going to be a tribute to him. So Good thank night, you all for watching. We appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, now, uh, now you can. Uh, all right, all right. Thank mm -hmm. you.